Okay, so welcome back to this next video. Uh, in the previous video, what we saw was, we saw that there were 17 different protein subunits which you could build nicotinic acetylcholine receptors out of. We have said that there could be an incredible uh, different number of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which you could build out of these 17 different uh, receptor subunits. However, we're going to study some specific ones. We're going to study the most important ones. And the one we began with was the adult neuromuscular junction uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor um, Okay, uh, and the reason I'm stressing that it's the adult um, acetyl nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction is because the fetal one is slightly different, and we'll discuss the fetal one in a moment. So we've seen that the adult neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor has these two alpha-1 subunits in red. It has this beta-1 subunit in blue here. Okay. It has uh, the delta subunit here in orange, okay, and finally it has the epsilon uh, subunit here in uh, green. Okay, right, so let me now show you the difference between the adult neuro, um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junctions and the fetal uh, neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So, again, I'll draw this cartwheel structure. And remember, we're seeing the receptor from the extracellular aspect. Okay. And let me split it into these five different portions here. Like so. Okay. And the protein subunit composition of uh, the fetal neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is almost identical. You have alpha-1 subunits here. Okay, so I'll circle these in this red cover. Again, so you have alpha-1 subunits here. In fact, you're only going to change one protein subunit. Okay, so these are the alpha-1 subunits. The beta-1 subunit remains the same, so let's circle that in blue again. Okay, and now you've got a 50-50 chance of guessing it. The delta subunit also remains the same. So delta in orange here remains the same. So what do you replace the epsilon subunit with? Well, basically, you replace it with the gamma subunit. So let me put gamma in there. So this is how the fetal uh, neuromuscular junction acetylcholine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is different from the adult neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So this is the fetal uh, neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So when you are uh, within the womb, uh, the, um, neurom the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which you have on the sarcolemma of your skeletal muscle cells are instead of this form. And this form is known as the alpha-1, 2, beta-1, and then you put delta again, but then finally gamma on the end. And again, it's a heteropentamer. Now, uh, these are the two uh, forms of uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that you find on skeletal muscle cells. Okay, and they are going to allow uh, sodium uh, ions to enter the cell and depolarize uh, the cell membrane when they open. But let's now discuss... Uh, which, uh, where the actual agonist, i.e. where acetylcholine binds to these receptors. And for this, we'll probably need to draw a slightly bigger picture. So, basically, the um, acetylcholine molecules, they bind um, between two subunits, and they bind here between the alpha-1 and the epsilon subunit here, and also here between the alpha-1 and the delta subunit. In the fetal one, it will be exactly the same, so between the alpha-1 and the delta subunit here, and also between this alpha-1 and gamma subunit here. So, let's discuss this binding site in a bit more detail. So, basically, if we uh, draw this picture a bit bigger this time, so here is a bigger cartwheel structure for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and I'll bring this down here a bit. Okay, right. So, this is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor viewed from the extracellular aspect. 
Let's make the pool very small. Okay, and here are five subunits here. Okay, and let's say it's the adult uh, form of the uh, neuromuscular junction uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, i.e. the alpha-1, 2, beta-1, delta, epsilon uh, form. Okay, so basically, you have special sites, special loops of the polypeptide on these alpha-1 subunits. You have, we know that this protein, this alpha-1 protein, is a protein. So basically, you have loops in the polypeptide that are very important in producing this binding site for the acetylcholine. And this loop here is known as the A loop. This loop here is known as the B loop. And this loop here is known as the C loop. Now, you also have structures on the delta subunit here. So let me just um, put this as the delta subunit up here. You also have structures on the delta subunit involved in the formation of this uh, ligand binding site. Okay. Now, these aren't actually loops in this case. Instead, they are beta beta cheats. However, it used to be thought that they were loops. So they are often drawn on pictures as being loops as well, and they are referred to as the loops, even though these D, E, and F, they are not actually loops. Instead, these are beta pleated sheets. So all the eight, or oh, sorry, all six of them, A, B, C, D, E, and F, which are just motifs on the polypeptide, they are referred to as the loops. Okay, so they are called the loops. However, only A through C are actually loops. And D, E, and F are instead beta pleated sheets. Uh, so this is an example of where uh, the, nomen the nomenclature hasn't kept up with the um, structural evidence. Okay, So beta pleated, not pleated again, sheets. OK, right. And these motifs on the polypeptide of the alpha-1 subunit here, which I'll circle in red. So this is the alpha-1 subunit here. And uh, the delta subunit above it in orange. These are what form the ligand binding domain for acetylcholine. So an acetylcholine molecule, or in fact another agonist molecule, it doesn't necessarily have to be acetylcholine, it could be another agonist. Um, this is where the acetylcholine or other agonists bind to uh, this receptor, in this gap between the alpha-1 and the delta subunit. Now you'll also have one of these, in between the alpha-1 and the epsilon, or the alpha-1 and the gamma subunit. So we'll label this one as epsilon slash gamma in the fetal case. Okay, and again what you have is three loops, the A, B, and C loops, and I've said those in the wrong order. This one is the A loop here, this one is the B loop, which I haven't got room to um, label, but that's the B loop in the middle, A, B, C. Okay, and on the epsilon slash gamma uh, so being it, again, you'll have the D, E, and F loops, although we no know they're really beta pleated sheets. And in here, you will then have uh, a binding site for acetylcholine. Okay, right. So, uh, there is also a bit of nomenclature that is quite common to see used, so I want you to be familiar with it. And basically, the subunits which have these A, B, and C domains on them, and we're going to see that this is a running theme through all of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, these are known as the principal subunits. So in this case, uh, the alpha-1 subunits are the acting as the principal subunits. And the two subunits, which in this case are delta or either epsilon uh, slash gamma, that are, have the D, E, and F motifs on them, so these two here, they are known as the complementary subunits. So they are the complement of um, the principal subunits. So they give the other portions that are necessary. So they are the complementary subunits. Right, so let me colour those in. So I won't colour in epsilon slash gamma because I had it in different colours down here, but I'll just outline the alpha 1 subunit in pink as well. Okay, and then we'll add on the final subunit that in these receptors does not take part in the ligand binding. 
which is this beta 1 subunit, which is over here. Okay, so that's not involved in the uh, binding of the ligand, basically, to uh, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are at the neuromuscular junctions. Okay, right. So, next thing to discuss is what are the agonists and what are the antagonists for these receptors? Right. Well, acetylcholine is obviously an agonist to this, these receptors. What acetylcholine will bind here? One acetylcholine will bind here. So two acetylcholines have to bind to these neuromuscular junction uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in order to activate them. Okay, uh, But when they do, they will cause the channel to open and it will then conduct ions. So acetylcholine, A-C-H, is an agonist for uh, these neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, now, it's called a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, but just think about smoking for a second. We know nicotine is in cigarettes. People who smoke, they get nicotine into their bloodstream. Now, let me now ask you a question. Do you think nicotine is an agonist for these uh, neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptors? Think through what would happen if it was. If it was, then when these people who, uh, who smoke smoked, they would get nicotine into their bloodstream and it would bind to these receptors and what would that cause? If it were an agonist for these receptors, which indeed nicotine is an agonist for nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but not this form, and I'll give you the answer now. Okay, if it were an agonist for these receptors, it would cause them to open and it would cause these skeletal muscle cells to undergo depolarization. And when they undergo depolarization, they uh, it causes them to contract. Now, do people who smoke get involuntary and uncontrolled muscle contractions? Okay, the answer is no. It will probably be fatal if it did cause that. Okay, and you wouldn't have many people smoking. So, nicotine is not, thankfully, an agonist for uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So not nicotine, although we will see that it is an agonist, whoops, nicotine, not nicotine, although we will see that it's an agonist for other types of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and we'll discuss in later videos why it is that nicotine cannot bind to this form of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, and we should be very thankful that it doesn't. It would probably kill you if it did. Okay, right. So, nicotine is not an agonist at neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so acetylcholine is an agonist but not nicotine. So let's now talk about antagonists. And there's one antagonist that uh, I think it would be very good for you to know. So an antagonist is a toxin that we got from snakes, basically. And it's known as alpha bungarotoxin. Okay, so alpha bungarotoxin is a competitive antagonist at a huge number of different nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but one of the ones where it works is the neuromuscular junction for as nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, alpha bungarotoxin is also often abbreviated to alpha BGTX, like so. Okay, so if you ever see alpha BGTX, you know that means alpha bungarotoxin. And as I say, it's in uh, the sna it's in snake venom. Basically, certain forms of snakes uh, have this in their venom. And what it's going to cause is it's going to bind to um, these binding sites for acetylcholine. So one alpha bungarotoxin molecule will bind there. One alpha bungarotoxin will bind there, and it's a competitive antagonist. So, when it binds, it does nothing 
to the receptor. It does not activate, but neither does it inactivate the receptor. Okay, this is a very important thing to understand. This is not an inhibitor of these receptors. It's an inhibitor of the binding of acetylcholine to these receptors. Alpha bungaritoxin will bind in the same site that acetylcholine needs to bind, and it will just sit there. It will do nothing to the receptor, but it will stop acetylcholine from being able to bind. So, when your neurons release acetylcholine onto uh, the skeletal muscle cells, acetylcholine won't be able to bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle cell because the alpha bungaritoxin is already there. So you won't be able to contract your muscles. So it will cause paralysis. Now, hopefully you can understand why that is very advantageous for the snake. It's going to paralyze its victims, basically. And this is how. Uh, so it can then eat them, basically. Right, so alpha bungaritoxin is a competitive antagonist for the binding site of acetylcholine to the neuromuscular junction uh, at nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so that's it for this video. Uh, in the next video, what we'll do is uh, continue to talk about nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and we'll move on to the ganglionic form.